<clears throat> All right, let's do a review of Stonewall Jackson's Way. 1992, Avalon Hill. <laughs> I think I've said this before. How did I miss these? These these things are the whole series. I don't. I mean, I don't know. You haven't got into all of them yet, but I played three scenarios in this one, and I'm addicted to this. <coughs> Excuse me. The coolest part is I only played with the base rules, and um, maybe just a couple of features that could be added to the base rules it, for me. That would make this thing pretty much perfect for an operational level type game. Um, so I used this is the rules of play that come with the game, the original game, the Avalon Hill rules. Uh, it has your scenarios in the back um, and your advanced rules come in with the scenarios and stuff. Advanced game rules are back here too. Um, but I did not, I only used the setups and the victory point conditions on this. <clears throat> um, I used from Multiman the sort of combined game rules. I think they're called 1.3 or something like that. Uh, these are from 2001, it looks like. But uh, you can download these offline from, a, what's it called, a Wargamers Archive or... You, well, you can go to Multiman's site and you can get a link there and uh, you can print these rules off. All right, so I played the game using the basic rules. Um, great system. It's initiative-based, dice roll, um, and you never know who's going to go each turn, whether it's going to be the Confederacy or whether it's going to be the Union. Uh, first off, <laughs> these maps, uh, I did, it's funny because I watched a YouTube documentary by Hamtag that, where he interviewed Charles Gibbler, or Tibbler, and I did not know who that was. Well, he's the guy that did these things. I found that on, in the, on the box, written on the box, or in the rules. But these, th you, you're talking from 92. This is flat out gorgeous. And I've looked at the, uh, I have uh, all but one of the Avalon Hill series. And they're all, they just get better as they go. And I've seen the multi-man ones, and they're, they look similar, but, you know, with multi-man's touch, and they're, these maps are outstanding. Now, Stonewall Jackson's Way comes with two maps covering uh, Northern Virginia, just, you know, I think it's from Richmond up, or Frederick, yeah, from Fredericksburg up to, well, I don't know. Never really look at this map that close. Yeah, somebody, whoever owned this before me has that little gluey stuff on it. i got to get that off of there. <clears throat> they folded the mat down. You did a great job. So so it goes, Cole, see, Fredericksburg down below here, Culpeper, uh, up towards Warrington, Manassas, and then over toward the Falls Church, just outside of D.C., the Fairfax area. I, I live in the area, so, you know, that's all familiar to me from growing up. But these maps are just gorgeous. And there's really, when you have to... Decide on something for terrain. The only thing that I had an issue with was uh, deciphering between the city, the town, because of the size of it, the way it's drawn on the map. I have I have a little, uh, or excuse me, a village or a town. So they've got it here where a town has a bunch of black foot building footprints in it. The village might have a just a couple small ones, but I don't know if that always means that there's only two, it's a village. Cause like, here's one on the map here that has like five in it. So I didn't know. That's probably the only confusion I had with this. And of course a town is a town with a railroad station. You know, like I know Fairfax courthouse, that's a town. Um, and a few other Warrington, there's a town with a railroad station in Warrington, but that trivial, extremely trivial. No other issues with terrain at all. And really, that was an issue, but that's a little confusing to look at. Um, uh, the counters, how much simpler can it be? <laughs> you want to break it down? You've got army, you've got corps, and then your, your physical combat units are usually divisions, brigades, maybe a regiment or two. And you have strength markers that... Uh, Go underneath them, and there's a strength marker. I probably can't see it. 
uh, it has two sides to it. It has its full strength side, and then it has a, a its dis, disorganized side. And you have, much like a terrible swift sword, you have a range of them from like starting at one, going all the way up to like uh, 18 or 19, depending on which, which game it is. Um, you have fatigue counters, you have damage counters, you have breastworks and forts, which uh, for this game here, you uh, you probably got to pull some uh, constructing breastworks markers. You can't entrench in anything before 1863 unless you use an optional rule, but you can. they can do breastworks and they can do forts. Uh, your damage and destroy markers for railroad stations, which ends up, that ends up being a majority of your objective, objectives is to damage or destroy uh, uh, railroad stations. And I think I said in one of the videos, you know, during the gameplay, Jackson destroyed Man Manassas Junction. I thought that was kind of sacrilegious for the South to destroy Man Manassas Junction, as big a role as it played in uh, 1861. Um, this game, uh, you've got two Union armies, the Army of Virginia with Pope and the Army of the Potomac with McClellan, which I know McClellan's in here somewhere, but I didn't see him get used. Uh, some of his corps were on here because they were trying to get their way back to D.C. after their failed Peninsula campaign. And it's a shame that McClellan didn't want to help Pope till it was too late because people, I guess from what I gather, he wanted Pope to fail so he could have control over everything again, I assume. Which... Eventually, he ended up anyhow because Antietam followed behind this sometime, and he was Mr. Hero for that. Um, Lee, Longstreet, Jackson, Stewart, you've got them um, with very good forces. Uh, not not overbearing, but strong forces, uh, their divisions. And you've got five or six scenarios, and you've got the advanced game scenarios. Um, Initiative-based, you roll. If it's a tie for the initiative, the Confederate gets the advantage. They get to go first. Uh, other than that, you know, it's just whoever wins, they get to execute an action, which I think the system's great. I mean, you can either do a core activation or a division activation or a district leader can do an activation of units within their command radius, which I believe is three for everybody. And... Um, you know, units subordinate to them. If you do an, a leader activation like that, then all those subordinates unit, whatever whatever dice roll you get for movement points for that type of leader, each of those units that you're going to do a march with, that's how many movement points they get. So you mark it on the turn on a, on a movement track, and then use another marker as you move each unit. Uh, you count down on that track. And the cool thing is, is while they're marching, a unit can attack on the march and then you have like four different options on what type of attack they can do that cost movement points so you got to make sure you have enough movement points to execute, and execute the attack and then what happens is, is you get a die roll modifier to the attack and uh depending on what type of attack it was you might have a minus three on your die roll or you might get a plus one and then when you do an attack you have a tactical modifier, which is leader rating against leader rating, and then you have an artillery modifier, which is uh, attacking artillery minus the defending artillery, and then you go to a chart, and you use whatever that differential is, and look at that chart, and you might have to roll a dice to see. You know, I think I had one on here where it was like plus eight for the Union attack and the Confederate. They had like eight more strength points than the Confederates, and uh, they only got like a, a die roll of plus one, which makes sense. You know, so that it's not, you don't destroy it. But then I've had battles where there was literally no artillery advantage. And I've had like a plus 10, you know, where it was like a, a force of 14 attacked in a, uh, a cavalry unit that decided not to retreat don't have a strength of one. So, you know, you, you've got to watch those things. Another cool feature about the game is cavalry retreat. This is probably the first time in a game, and I agree, I got a lot of games to go through. A lot of older games that there might have been rules updates to that I need to look into. But this game got the use of cavalry correct. Cavalry was a screening force. They were your fog in the mountain gaps that protected the movements of the main body from prying eyes of their enemies or to divert 
the enemies, by making them think something else is going on, by being somewhere other than where the main body was. Uh, it, it, think of it like it's like your your like a, a, a tinted window. You know, you've got your window open in a car. Well, everybody outside can see in through that window when it's down. But you roll that dark tinted window up, and all of a sudden now they can't see in there. Well, that that cavalry's like that tinted window. Uh, they get out there and they scream. Now, here's here's how it's used in this game. You you during a movement for cavalry, say that uh, Union First Corps is on the move and they're headed towards an objective, or they're headed to hit one of the a, a weaker Confederate division that they've got trapped somewhere. Or they're just trying to get after them. Well, you get a movement, you get the initiative, and you decide, okay, I'm going to take this cavalry unit. You move him down there adjacent to that unit, that Union unit, or you put him somewhere in the path. Whenever a Union unit either starts adjacent, or I'm sorry, whenever an enemy unit starts adjacent to a cavalry unit and executes movement, or he moves into a hex adjacent to a cavalry, the cavalry unit can do a retreat. And what happens is, is depending on the size of the force, you got to, there's a chart for that. You'll roll a die, and you'll cut that die roll in half. There might be a modifier. And whatever that die roll is, is how many movement points you remove from that union moving unit. So let's say you have zero modifiers, and a union division moves into a, a cavalry brigade's zone of control. And he's got, let's say he's got... 10 movement points, and he just spent three, and he's adjacent to that cavalry unit. And you decide to give that cavalry unit, I'm going to retreat. I'm going to do a cavalry retreat. So you roll your dice, and let's say you roll a six, and there's no modifiers. So you cut that six and a half to a three. Well, now the, the seven movement points that the union unit had left gets reduced down to four. I found that to be... Super useful at the end of the game when I was trying to conserve a couple locations for victory points, having units next to these locations for victory points, by throwing one strength cavalry units out there against Union divisions just to put them in check to cut some of their in it. Two of the turns it paid off because it eliminated their movement points. They didn't, there was nothing left. They couldn't move any farther. Um, however, they were able to push two of the cav units out, but that third one stayed. And then, of course, one of the two that got pushed out, he had. Fatigue level three, he had one more move left in him. He came back into that that victory point zone and got the two points for that. So don't when you do play this, don't just frivolously throw that cavalry into a conflict unless you've got something for sure. Uh, use them. Use them to screen the movement of your enemies. It doesn't matter what side you're playing. If you see an opportunity to delay a major force on the move, Use it. This that is the so far the best cavalry use in a game that I have I've come across so far. And I've, I've played quite a few. I haven't really played any operational strategic type stuff yet until this. But I've played a lot of tactical stuff where, yeah, and I watch other people's videos too. And you're like, man, I almost never do nothing with cavalry unless they can shoot. Uh, unless they have rifles or carbines, they can shoot like the infantry. So then once in a blue moon, you might get a cavalry charge, and it's kind of fun, but <laughs> then it's done, it's over, and you're not really sure what else to do with them. I mean, most time when you play a game like that, everybody puts them out on the flank, and they're just there to, you know, just in case the infantry happens to wander by in column, and they can charge them, all right? Other than that, you never really see them getting used that often. Uh, I'm going to play, um, I've got um, Rebel Sabres up here, eh, somewhere up here, I've got it, but... Uh, I'm eventually, I had that years ago and I, I must have sold it and I bought it again, but I'm going to get that out and that's just pretty much straight cavalry and I'm going to get that eventually on the table and I guess I'll get a chance to see what cavalry on cavalry is really like, so um, like three or four or five good battles in there. All right, back to uh, Stonewall Jackson's way. You, get, you got uh, three pages of charts, um, well, four if you count this little, you got a county supply sheet, which just, this comes into effect in the... Uh, the advance or uh, grand campaign. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me, where got that from? It's not COVID, relax. Um, this is a supply thing, you know, if uh, you own a certain county, you get so many supply points whenever supply is used, which I have not dug into that yet. So I talked about earlier about two things that I think could be added to the base rules. Um, the command structure is great, um, but I'm finding 
that for like the army of Northern Virginia, like Lee, his leadership, um, the army's leader's command value on his on his counter here is pretty much only for a, if you do a grand assault, which I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, other than that, he doesn't really, that I'm aware of, unless I'm missing something, has a whole lot of effect. I'm, I'm probably saying that, and there probably is something. But uh, you would use that command rating if you're trying to do a grand assault, like say, what you're talking about. So, and then I've seen, um, who was it, Kev with Big Board, Game, Big Board Gaming playing, um, was it Atlanta is ours, I think? Where all the units have to be within eight hexes of Tecumseh Sherman, all the Union units, to be able to do anything. So I'm wondering if that rule is kind of floating around somewhere for that. Maybe in the advanced rule, there's more to it. So a rule for that, and then maybe have some kind of a supply rule in the base game, the basic rules game. Because um, there really isn't anything. Uh, everything I saw said pointed to the advanced game. So um, I, I would say if you added those two in there, because I think pretty much everything else is pretty well handled. Um, yeah. <laughs> The game is not, it's not difficult. I mean, okay, so, you know, you win your initiative, you pick what you're going to do. So you've got a division. Let's say you got two divisions stacked with their core commander in one hex, right next to an enemy. And on the other side of the enemy, you've got two more divisions with another core commander stacked in a hex. So, here's your options. You can do a march and move one unit, and that one unit can attack on the move. Okay? That would probably be kind of silly. Or, you can do an assault. An assault costs, there's no movement points involved. You don't even have to, you know, you just, if you win the initiative and you want to do an assault because you have a unit that can do it, you do the assault, there is a no movement point cost for that. Um, in the process of determining the assault, you can decide, oh, I got other units that aren't part of my subordinate organization or my core or whatever. I want to bring them in. Well, if you got an army commander there, he can uh, he can implement that grand assault by a process of getting those units on the other side that are adjacent to the enemy into the fight. So combat on the march is one unit. Whatever unit you're moving, they can conduct combat on the fly as they're moving. An assault is the units in one hex, you pick a leader, it can be a division leader, which is usually what your combat units look like, a uh, core leader, uh, they, a dis district leader, uh, I think, I don't know, I have to look at it, I can remember if it's normally or not, but this is where you attempt to get all the units in that hex into an organized assault, an organized attack. And there's a dice roll process, and you subtract the dice roll from the unit's leader, whoever the leader is you chose, so, and I found a lot of them where, you know, these command ratings on these guys aren't, you know, I think Jackson's got like a 5-6, Longstreet's got like a, I think he's got a, no, he's got a 4. Um, you know, most of your Confederate division leaders have 3s, your unions, a lot of them have 3s, most of them have 2s, you got a few that have 1s. So you roll a dice and you subtract that dice from their lead, their command value. And there is one that has a modifier for a district leader. So, <laughs> I would have like a command rating of 3 and try to do an assault with three units stacked in one hex, and I'd roll a freaking four. All right, well, if you roll the dice and you roll a six, unmodified six, the assault's over. Every unit in the hex, because you declared that hex as being the assault where you're going to do the assault, they all get fatigued. Okay, everybody that you, you chose to go in here is going to get fatigued, regardless of whether they get to attack or not. All right, so let's say you have three units, and you roll a one, and his command rating is three. So... That leaves two. So two of your three units of that hex will be part of the assault. They have to be, once you start the process, you have to execute it. No matter if you screw up the dice roll and your odds become terrible, you still got to do it. All right, so now you got two units getting ready to do an assault. And you get down to, I think it's step six of the assault procedure. You, just, you have an army commander and you're like, wait a minute. Let's use those two divisions on the other side to attack. And let's, let's turn this into a grand assault. Well, then you've got to roll the dice for the Grand Assault. Now, here's the difference in the Grand Assault. So, let's say the Army Commander that's sitting there, or the Corps Commander, whatever, his rating is a 5. 
Now, the, the units sitting on the other side uh, uh, don't have to be part of the subordinate. They can be from, a, like, you could have Army Virginia over here, and these units on the backside of that enemy or Army of the Potomac. It doesn't matter in the Grand Assault. They can bring them in, coordinated attack, coordinated combat between armies or whatever. So now when you roll the dice and you subtract uh, that dice roll from the command value, it's not the number of units in the other hex, it's the number of hexes. So if you have a unit surrounded and this command value is a five and you roll a one, that means that's four. You can have all the units of four additional hexes that are adjacent to the enemy added in to the assault. All right, so once you determine that, then you go back to your assault steps and you determine your tactical modifier, your artillery modifier, and you do your combat and you check your chart, which is really kind of cool. Um, I want to say I've seen this done a different way. So what you do on the combat chart is you'll subtract the defender's die roll from the attacker's die roll. So, you know, there's going to be modifiers for is it a flank attack, is it across a bridge or a dam or a ferry. You know, so you'll, you'll check for all your modifiers. You know, you'll get a modifier for your tactical value difference, for your artillery value difference. And like I said, there's that artillery modifier table on here. And then you'll cross-reference. You'll cross-reference the die roll, whether it's up or down. Here's on the defenders, and you'll find their strength. Now, for these units, the manpower and the combat power value are the same number on the front. But when they're disorganized, their manpower is still 13 on this unit, but his combat power is now only 9. So when you figure out the odds, you use the 9. But... When you're figuring out the results, you use the 13, you use the manpower value, okay? Um, well, not to get back, it says combat value on here, but I want to say I read where it says use the manpower because you still got, you know, if that 13 means 1,300 men, you still got 1,300 men right there in that fight, even though they're not, you know, their combat value is not very good. But you cross-reference, and then you'll get your results, and they have an explanation of the results right here. You know, and there's quite a few results you can get, but they're all pretty simple to handle. Most of them require the units um, <coughs> strength being disorganized, uh, fatigue. All right, so so in this game, fatigue is fatigue and manpower loss are probably the big things. You've got fatigue levels from one to four. A unit a unit's strength can be disorganized or or organized. A leaders, a divisional leader can be or exhausted on his backside, uh, on the backside of the counter, which has, will have a stripe across it. And those do affect, uh, it might change some of their tactical or artillery values. Um, if you've got an exhausted unit and you start a turn and you, you move him, you march him, or you do something with him, he gains a fatigue level. Uh, uh once he reaches, you can only take one after that. Once he reaches two, then he's going to stay on that exhausted side. So, you know, the only way to do it really is if you didn't ever want to get a unit to end up exhausted, you would only execute two things with them and hope to God in combat he didn't get hit with a third one or God forbid a fourth one because then you're, you're spending a whole turn trying to recover maybe two, all right? And it, yeah, it does affect things. It affects movement and stuff like that. All right, so in general, uh, initiative-based, you know, whoever wins the die roll, they go. And the action cycle doesn't end until either both pass, or I think there's a special die roll in the advanced game. If both sides roll a one in the initiative, then the game turn ends. Um, I guess, you know, that's your indecision of commander. Neither one can figure out what they want to do, so the turn just ends and nothing happens. And then you move the turn marker, which is in one day's. Uh, from what I understand, the hexes are a mile, so uh, that explains how you can move and do combat on the move and how aggressive, you know, the die court, there you go, your fog of war is the die roll again for your determining your movement. Now, the Confederates in this game, uh, a regular infantry division, to determine his movement, he rolls one six-sided dice and he gets a plus one. If it's a leader, if it's a Confederate infantry leader, he gets or like Longstreet or Jackson or, well, not Lee, but Longstreet or Jackson, he rolls one dice and he gets plus two added to it. If it's Stuart Cavalry, he gets rolled two dice and he gets a plus three. So when you're doing a leader activation using 
one of those, Stewart's going to get a plus three for his counter move. The Union doesn't touch that. <laughs> their, their standard is for just an infantry unit. It's just one six-sided dice, no adjustment. For the cavalry, it's just two six-sided dice, no adjustment. If it's a, a leader activation for infantry, they get plus one. And if it's a leader activation for ca I think cavalry only gets plus one on, on two, two six-sided dice. All right, so initiative base, whoever goes, whoever has initiative, they go, do your thing. Uh, try to attain your victory points. Uh, all the turns I've played, uh, you know, there's not, there, you don't accumulate victory points in a, in a, for like both sides. I mean, yeah, both sides can earn them, but when the Union earns victory points, it's more you're subtracting it away from what the Confederates have earned. That's how it works. So, you know, you're only look, and then usually your results will say, hey, if it's this many points differential, or if the Confederates have this many victory points, they get a decisive victory. Or if they have this many victory points, the Union ends up getting a marginal victory over the Confederates. And that's how the game's played. So you run out an action cycle, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with activations until, like I say, both pass or there's just nothing else you can do or there's nothing else you want to do. Um, and then you both just, you both pass. Turns over, you do a recovery phase where you start to remove all your fatigues and your exhaustions and stuff like that. And uh, then you move the turn forward and you start the next one again. Not a whole lot of steps in this game, really not. You, you have a leader transfer phase where you can pick up your one of your leaders and move them to a different subordinate unit somewhere on the map. You know, like in Lee's case, you might pick him up, move him halfway across the map to to from Jackson's Court or Longstreet's Court somewhere. But you emerge at your leaders, the ones that'll have the pictures on them, they have to be with a subordinate unit or with another unit, they can't, with a combat unit. They cannot be off on their own. Um, all right. So that's it. Uh, I think what we're going to do is my next thing is I'm going to try to do an instructional block on the base rules so that there's somebody out there that really wants to play but they just can't get into the, the rules or maybe they're just not grabbing them. I'm going to try to go through the sequence of play with the base rules and the, the, oh, the biggest stressful part will be just doing the combat, the three different types of combat you got and hopefully kick something out that somebody can use and play the game. Hey, if you like this and you, you want to see more, and I'm hoping that I'm getting better as I'm doing each of these, give me a like on there. Give, subscribe. Hit, click that bell for notify so that you can keep up to date with what I'm doing. I, I'll try to get this one posted up as fast as I can. And uh, I think the next thing we'll come back with will be the instructional block on this. I'm Jeff with Hex to Hex Gaming. Talk to you later. Thanks all.